Hey everybody, hey, I'm uh, Chris with Decoding Cocktails and today I'm here with uh, Mitchell Albers from Prairie Farms. And uh, what's great is we're gonna walk you through how to make a cocktail and Mitchell is gonna talk to you why this crazy clarified milk process actually works in the first place, so. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Chris. Uh, my name is Mitchell Albers. I'm a food scientist. I went to the University of Missouri and I've been working for Prairie Farms for the quality department for about two and a half years now. And so, when I've done research into things like clarified cocktails before, uh, I see words like casein and pH balance and all these things, and I just nod my head and go, that sounds important. And thankfully, Mitchell's the kind of guy that can tell you about this here. So in the um, recipe that we sent over, at the end of the day, the root of a lot of clarified cocktails, because they can get very complex, but are a lot like building a basic sour cocktail. Now, to make sure we're all on the same page, what in the heck is that? A sour cocktail is a thing like a gin gimlet, a daiquiri, or a whiskey sour. And all of these are, are consist of a spirit, citrus, and sugar. And they tend to be in a roughly two parts spirit to either, excuse me, uh, either typically two ounces to make, make a proper cocktail, two ounces spirit, and then either three quarters or an ounce of fresh citrus and simple syrup. So it's kind of you can kind of play typically with a little bit of how much citrus and syrup you're putting in there. But really what we're going to be doing is we're going to be building a sour cocktail. And from there, we're going to be introducing it in to milk. Because this experiment takes a minute, what we're going to do is we're going to begin building the cocktail pretty much right now. And then we're going to stop to kind of talk about what's actually happening right here. So where we're going to start today, I need eight ounces of gin. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to measure out eight ounces of this gin right here. Very, very scientific. That was, so at home I'd probably be using a scale, but uh, that's okay. We don't need to do that for right now. Uh, I'm gonna use, gin pairs very well with lime or lemon juice. And so I'm going to, in this case, so I can see it better. Sorry guys, hiding this one from you. Uh, I'm gonna use three ounces of lemon juice right here. And then I need my simple syrup right here. So I'm going to measure out three, quarter, three ounces of simple syrup. Now, when we are clarifying a cocktail, something that's useful to know is because when we actually bring our milk in, the average cocktail is typically at least 20 plus percent water. Because we're going to be adding milk to this cocktail, milk is a significant portion of that is water. And so it's going to help us dilute the cocktail. So something that you can do with a clarified cocktail is sometimes you can even make the ratio a little bit oozier. And so to that end, let's say we pause for a minute here to make sure I didn't lose anybody. So say you're making our requisite whiskey sour. You would have done eight ounces of whiskey, three quarters ounce of lime or lemon, and three quarters ounce of simple syrup. From there, if you're going to be playing with something like Campari or your whiskey sour, if you have that on hand, you're going to grab an ounce of it. What I'm going to do in the case of this vermouth right here is I'm going to add about an ounce of vermouth here. And really, this is just going to help add a little bit of dryness and a little bit of proofing to our cocktail right here. How are we doing so far? Doing good. All right, perfect. We want to be supervised by scientists when you're doing things like this. Um, from here, when it comes to making this, and again, after we've kind of gotten our experiment started here, we're going to slow down and talk about this a little bit more. There's a general school of thought, and you, this kind of varies, but what people tend to say is, so right now I have put 14 ounces, 15 ounces, I want to do the math properly, of liquid into this Cambro right here so far. People often say you should roughly take the, the liquid amount that you've, you've added so far and divide that roughly by four. And so to that point, that means that I need about four ounces of delicious Prairie Farms whole milk. Mitchell's going to talk to you about why we're going to use whole milk. But I'm going to go ahead right now and I'm going to add whole milk into this separate container right here, okay? From here, and I'll tell you what, Mitchell, if you want to actually hold this up for the camera right sure. here so everybody can see this. Yeah. So you can really, and Mitchell again will talk about this in just a minute, you can either pour the milk into the cocktail or the cocktail into the milk. A lot of people say you should do this. So Wait, 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 Chris. Well, hold on. Before we go any further. That's right. For the curdling process, yeah. we need proper 
Eye protection. Get your safety glasses on, folks. Here we go. So we're going to go ahead now and pour this right in here like so. And very quickly, you should hopefully begin to see that we're going to begin to have some curds forming in here. This is kind of beginning to get cloudy right away. So at this point in time, I wanna, I'll say one thing and then we're gonna kind of stop and we're gonna talk about what is actually happening here. And we're gonna make sure that if you have questions, please, please, please uh, drop them in the chat. We'd love to hear them from you guys. But at this point in time, what people kind of say in general is you want to have kind of a chance for things to marry for a little bit. We're gonna do this in a slightly accelerated form here. You're always welcome to slow it down at your house. What's really important about today is getting comfortable with how this process works. I'm gonna let this sit right here. So Mitchell, I obviously did all the talking so far. Is there anything you'd like to say so far just to kind of start us off about what, because what's been great about this is when I reached out, uh, Mitchell said he'd be happy to help me with this. Are there things that you've learned about this process that you think are interesting to share? At the I, top of your head? I think uh, milk washing was a new concept to me. Uh, like I said, I've been in the dairy business for uh, two and a half years at Prairie Farms and about three and a half years before that. I'd never heard of milk washing. Um, I enjoyed myself a cocktail and mixology a little bit. So when Chris reached out, I was happy to uh, happy to help him out. But the the thing to know with with this is if you add acid to dairy, um, if you get that pH low enough, it reaches what's called the isoelectric point. And at that point, the proteins in the milk actually will curdle. So they go through a process called denatur denaturation. Um, so that protein is you could imagine it's kind of all clumped up in a globule and so when it denatures the amino acids that make up that protein kind of unravel so you have long strands of amino acids and then they kind of form back together so it does basically an unraveling and folding back together in a different form which is why you see those curves as we call them right so. and mitchell in in some point because I, I think about things like cottage cheese for example yeah so because sometimes people hear the term hurdling and they immediately go, oh God. So, but in general, some of the dairy people are consuming is going through this curdling process. Right. Uh, and, and so anyway, so people shouldn't be totally freaked out by the idea. There's obviously this idea of like, whoa, we've just combined this with milk. Yeah. But it's really something that happens very commonly. Right. Um, curdling, I would say historically, maybe, you know, pre-1930 or whenever refrigeration came in, uh, curdling on milk would be a bad thing, but nowadays we actually do um, basically controlled uh, curdling to make things like cheese and cottage cheese and um, sour cream and other products like that. We acidify the product, whether it be with uh, with um, actual acids or or enzymes or whatever, and so that's how we make a lot of products on the market now today. So something to talk about in terms of like. So we're here, we're, we're making a clarified cocktail. Why are we doing this in the first place? Why does this even exist? So a uh, couple of things to know. So milk washing has been around for about 350 years is kind of its history. So it's wow. had it's had fans like Benjamin Franklin and Charles Dickens of all people. So there you go. So you're in tune with real history right there. But the reasons why this was started in the first place is whether or not you are a lover of drinking a spirit straight right now or cocktails in general, well, I would imagine you are, otherwise you probably be on this call. Um, but what's important to know is that we were not even as good as making spirits back in the day as we are now. There's a couple people waiting in that waiting room right there. Do you mind? Sorry. We'll uh, we'll get them. Uh, here, you know what? Here, I'll, I'll keep talking. We'll, we got them right here. We got to get all these people in here. So perfect. Sorry about that. That's right. This is to show that this is really a live event. But the reason why we curdle cocktails is two things. The first thing is that when we begin to curdle this cocktail, it is the curds are right now currently absorbing a lot of things like the lemon pulp into them. And so when we begin to absorb the organic materials into them, the cocktail is going to become more shelf stable. But also, and Mitchell can talk to this part more in terms of why it works, but I always like to say, if you remember Little Miss Muffet, she sat on her tuffet eating curds and whey. We, we've talked about the curds so far, but right now, and again, Mitchell can really talk more about the science of this, as the curds have begun to separate from the whey, when we begin to strain this cocktail out, the whey is going to actually pass through 
this cocktail. And that's going to not only dilute the cocktail, but create kind of a creamier nature to it, which is going to make the cocktail easier to drink. Right. So just to kind of take over from there, as we talked about, the curd is actually the protein. So um, just to kind of briefly go over the components of milk, you have 87% of it is basically water. And then you have some butter fat. You have some protein, some lactose, which is the sugar of milk, and then vitamins and minerals. So those components make up milk. And as we talked about, the curd itself is the protein. So that that matrix will will basically, you know, denature. So it unravels. And then when it ravels back up, you're talking about grabbing onto the lemon pulp or, or other things present in the cocktail. So it grabs onto those. And then that's the protein. So what we still have left is vitamins and minerals, lactose, which is the sugar and fat. So the residual is water. And they typically call that the whey because it has those components still present. So the way, as you mentioned, the creaminess will come from actually some of that fat that's present in the in the milk previously to the curdling. Mm -hmm. So you're separating out that that protein and leaving everything else left. Got it. And to make sure I followed this or not, Mitchell. So um, when for someone that might dairy might not always agree with them. Yeah especially if it's more of a lactose issue, right? how much, so when we kind of have the residual whey mm -hmm. left over, how much, like, if so, like, should someone who has a, maybe just a minor dairy, like, issue, like, right. is going, is consuming whey going to be something they should just steer clear of entirely? I guess I'm curious, like, is this something that is relatively safe for someone or or how would you think about that my recommendation is if they uh there, there is still lactose present in this milk so obviously there's lactose free milk out on the market um but if they have issues with lactose containing products i would think that this would be very similar um effect okay okay cool so there you go so don't don't get too uh too carried away with this here so Great. in a perfect world i've seen people say that you should let things strain for our Mary for kind of 30 plus minutes. We don't want to create, keep you guys here all night. The straining process can also take a little while. So we're going to talk about it for a minute. We're going to start that. If at home, you want to hold on for a little while, there's no pressure. But also the good news is, is that this is hopefully as you're already seeing, it's not super hard once you kind of begin to understand what's happening here. So I'm going to grab this other new Cambro over here. And what's important to know about the straining of the cocktail is what we really want ultimately is whether you're using a coffee filter, in this case, I have a fine mesh strainer with a paper towel in it right here. What the coffee filter or the paper towel is doing is it's really kind of giving the curds a place to rest. But what's really important is that the liquid needs to actually pass through the curds in order to clarify. So. When you kind of begin to, to do this process, what people will often find is that initially the first bit of the cocktail is always still going to be somewhat cloudy. And then a lot of times people will, even after they've strained the whole cocktail through the curds at a lot of cocktail bars that serve this, they even pour it back through the curds a second time, which makes the cocktail clearer and richer. Do you have any thoughts, Mitchell, on if we've already strained the cocktail once? I don't know that I... We, we prepped with this question here. Sure. But any thoughts on if I was going to pass the drink through the curds a second time as to why that would make the drink even richer? Any thoughts on that? So I would think that the premise on that, you know, when you filter items, filter liquids or whatever, you're you're basically pulling out components. Okay. So if you're to do that, um, your matrix or your your filter media, if you will. So that'd be your sifter your uh, paper towel, or eventually the curtain, your media will eventually kind of clog up. So typically what I would say is, uh, uh, you know, they distill multiple times, they they uh, they strain multiple times, things like that. It's, it's to make sure they're pulling out more components. So it's yeah. offering you basically a second chance to, to filter out more items, Got more it. components. Because I will say, uh, when I've run something through filtration once, it absolutely becomes a clear drink. But the second time it is, it is mar it's, it's markedly clearer. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and start this right now. And potentially, depending on how this filtration works, we may even, if we begin to have a nice bed of curds here, I may even 
switch to filtering in this and then pour this stuff through again. But anyway, so we're gonna start this filtering process right here. And we're gonna kind of slowly begin to see that immediately the curds will kind of have begun to really trap a lot of that right there. So you can kind of see that they're already resting right on top of this. Something that I heard recently that today I'm doing for the first time and why not try it in a live environment? Um, I've heard people say that, that I, I've used coffee filters for mm. filtering every time. Sure. I'm guessing that the knitting on them is so tight. It's very fine. Yeah, compared to a paper towel, I, I, I've seen a couple of bartenders talk about using, because ultimately with the curds creating the, the real filtration pass through that we want, right. they've actually said there's no well, harm in using a coffee filter. You just need to know that the filtration process is gonna take even Way longer. longer. So, so this is kind of the process where, especially when you're doing this at home, once you've begun to get all of the liquid into the cocktail at this point, might be the moment when you're like, all right, now that I've gotten everything strained into here, I'm gonna go do the laundry, cut the grass, et cetera, because this can begin to take a little bit of time right here. But this is kind of the beginning process right here. Um, but ultimately, once this has strained out, and especially like I've said, you've done this a second time, is when you really are gonna begin to reach uh, what's ultimately a clarified, relatively shelf-stable cocktail at that point in time. We should check, would you mind checking our chat just to see if we have, if I've missed anything from anybody right there. Um, also to everybody out there, uh, this will of course later on be posted to YouTube. You can always reference it as, you know, an online visual and we'll also link back to the doc with the, uh, recipes as well. So, so one of the things that I would, uh, any, anything to add right now? Nothing yet, Chris. Okay. Um, uh, so one of the other things that I wanted to talk about, I remember us discussing in advance is like, you know, we're all in a grocery store from time to time. So we see milk in the aisle. Sure. And like milk is milk is milk to a lot of us. Mm. So how do we think about at times the difference of any markers of what does it mean for good quality? And so clearly we can talk about like what Prairie Farms offers, but right. are there things people should think about when they're actually making the choice of like buying branded milk versus whatever the heck happens to be on the shelf? Right. Uh, yeah. A lot of people, I mean, I even have family buy whatever's on the shelf and I always point them in the direction of Prairie Farms because there is a reason that we have a high quality product. Uh, we're actually owned by the farmers. A lot of people don't know that we're, we're a cooperative. So we're owned by farmers. There's around 600 farms right now that, that own Prairie Farms as a whole. So uh, if, if anybody ever sees one of our trucks on, on, the, uh, on the road, it says locally sourced. Well, that's because we have 600 farms that are strategically located around all of our processing plants. So that, that milk, goes right from the farm. So they have a, they have obviously a, a uh, investment in that product. So they make sure to have a high quality on their farms, you know, making sure the cows are taken care of, fed well, um, that there's a sanitary milking operation going on. We go, we pick up the milk from the farm. And then, you know, there's, there's actually a rule of thumb that we can turn around milk in about 48 hours. So it was in the cow and then we milk it. And within 48 hours, that cat, that milk goes from the farm to a processing plant to the grocery store, and you and I can go pick it up. So we have a high quality program from from farm to fork, as we said. Okay. So yeah. So if you like your milk uh, trucked in halfway across the country and to be you know no more than a couple of weeks old, we recommend buying whatever generic brand uh, <laughs> is out there. But uh, so that is yeah. So anyways, I I kind of like that this kind of offers it. Let me. I'm always very smart, but let me see if there were other questions I actually wanted to talk about here initially in terms of regarding yeah, actually the couple of oh, chapters of questions. Oh, here we go. Uh, yeah, you know what? Yeah, that, that was one of the questions. So, Mitchell, would you mind talking about? Um, and it's not to say that a person couldn't use 2% milk, right? But do you mind talking about like it seems like a lot of people tend to prefer whole milk. What I've seen about okay. cream is people say that you cream is great, but it kind of has that richy, that kind of rich aroma to it. Right. Would you mind talking about uh, what, why a person might consider using whole milk as opposed to another milk potentially for this process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you made a comment about cream. So just to kind of bring everyone in on the same page, the, 
the, the, the difference between skim milk, 1%, 2%, whole milk, and then the cream products, half and half, heavy cream, heavy whipping cream, is, is primarily the butter fat. So that's the fat level, the fat content. Um, as we mentioned previously, when you do this process, you're pulling out the protein. So what's left behind is one of those components is the fat. If you use skim milk, there's there's no fat in skim milk. So obviously you're not going to get the the creamy texture that okay. we're that we're familiar with fat, right? You yeah. know that's why ice cream is so creamy um, because it's high in butter fat. If you use a heavy cream, that might be too much cream, so you might get overwhelmed. It might okay. it might just completely take over the cocktail. So I think full milk is is as close as you can get to you know. Um, from the cow. And I think that's probably why and why people usually stick to that because it's got a good ratio and just enough fat to kind of give you that, that creaminess note without taking over. Okay. And it's interesting. I was sharing uh, part of a clarified cocktail actually uh, where, where the one is I was sharing with them earlier, but it doesn't matter. So I was sharing it with um, a woman yesterday and she kept trying to say to me, I feel like I can taste the milk. And I was like, well, I mean, maybe you can, but what I said was like, oh, like, but I mean, the thing that's going to be distinctive about this is that uh, because of the fat, it is going to be creamier. And she goes, creamier. That, that's, that's what it is right there. And so that that's helpful to know that it is the fat content in the way that is creating that creaminess. And if we are using a lower proof milk, you're, you might still be able to do this process, but the drink isn't going to be as creamy for that reason. Right. Um, so here's a question, because I've, I've heard people talk about using wine versus lemon. Obviously, uh, we all know that they're both very sour, but certainly I would imagine the pH, if I do this right in my head, is going to probably be even lower on a lemon on a lime because it's more sour. Yes. If I was, so I made this cocktail and I used three ounces of lemon. Okay. And if I used three ounces of lime instead, can you, if something at a pH point below that 4.6, can you think of any reason, is that going to change the curdling process at all? Or it's, or it's more like it just needs to hit that level. And once it does, the process is going to happen. You're spot on. Okay. That's it. Once you, as long as you drop the milk to that pH level of 4.6, which is what the lemon juice or yep. lime juice is going to do, you're good. The yep. curdling will take place. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So something else that's important to think about is outside of this, you know, for the people out there that are real, you know, cocktail geeks at home or those who really like experimenting, any cocktail that has a large amount of citrus in it is going to be uh, viable for this. So I was telling them one of the things I'm going to experiment with uh, later this week is I'm going to attempt to clarify a Mai Tai. So as you begin to kind of think about drinks you like, uh, the margarita is another great one that could obviously be curdled as well. So once you get comfortable with this idea of like, I'm going to build whatever my cocktail is, and I'm going to pour it into kind of roughly this four to one ratio of cocktail to milk. And then you kind of begin this filtration process. Uh, that is really the key to kind of arriving at whatever finish line right there. Uh, something else, would you mind handing me that bottle right there? Something else to think about. Uh, we did not build the whiskey sour today and I'm not really gonna bother with it. But another thing keeping in mind that we are really diluting this cocktail quite a bit with all of the milk that we're adding to it. If you have something, you know, like for example, if you're building a whiskey sour, you might be a person like bourbon and whiskeys are huge in the world right now. So you might be a person that has various like barrel, barrel select barrel whiskeys that are super high proof. This guy from Barrel Bourbon is 61% uh, ABV. This is the kind of thing where you could always dump a little half ounce or ounce of a higher proof spirit in there, because again, uh, it's going to kind of impart some of those rich flavors but it's going to be thinned out to where it's not super overwhelming. I've seen people do the same thing with high proof rums when they're making a daiquiri, for example. Okay. Hey, you, you mind taking a look at our questions there, Mitchell? What, what do the folks at home want to know? Someone's asking, uh, he knows bartenders use heated milk to clarify. Yep. Is there a reason behind it? And it looks like it's from Barry okay. or C. Barry. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, oh. it, so th this is perfect for you right here. So, yeah, so talk absolutely. about the properties of milk when it would be heated versus room temperature, because people do do both. Right, right. So uh, the process with, with milk when you heat it, uh, like we talked about with pH, um, proteins can denature through two processes. One is pH, the other is heat. So um, 
what I understand people using that that method is they're they're basically doing a pre denaturing of the proteins. Um, and without having do, done it myself, I can't can't really speak to what exactly that that will provide you for a difference in the end product on your cocktail. But that's the premise. They're trying to denature that protein initially. Um, I don't know if maybe there's a chance that it's going to grab onto more things from the cocktail and pull them out or or what exactly the end product will be, but that's that's the premise. So I'm doing it. And at the very end, I'll share a couple of other links, but uh, it's 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 interesting. And uh, I think it's uh, Christopher Berry. So uh, uh, so you know, for example, uh, my good friend and mentor uh, Tim Wiggins at uh, Yellow Belly and Lazy Tiger here in St. Louis. I know Tim eats up his milk. Um, and then also at the other end of things, you have uh, groups like America's Test Kitchen who ran all these. Exam, uh, a B tests with we're going to make the same cocktail with skim milk, 2%, whole milk. We're going to try heating the milk. We're going to try room temperature milk. And they found overall uh, that uh, working with room temperature milk worked. And so I think that the big thing is it seems like that we are successfully denaturing the milk with this with, by acidifying it here. Right. But you could potentially be giving it a jump start. It just seems that some people haven't found that it's worth the additional effort yeah. but i have also heated milk and i ended up with a lovely finished product it but it seems like overall that it's not uh required and, and so it's uh, something to think about going forward for the, those who really want to experiment at home make a bigger batch of cocktails put it in two vessels pour in cold milk and your heated milk and you can kind of then a b test the finish but it seems that overall we begin to start splitting hairs at that point where people haven't necessarily determined that it needs to happen per se. Yeah. Yeah. If they want to provide the, uh, the science experiment by all means, but I'd say do what's easiest. Yeah. Because it should work both ways. Yeah. So it seems like overall it is. And so, so as you can see, you know, down here in our little Cambro right here, we certainly have what is a relatively clear cocktail, but what would be recommended at this point in time would be for us to begin, because I would imagine, so I'll tell you what, let's do this right now. So how the process would potentially work. So let's say that now we kind of have a very solid bed of curds right here. Right. And I remember I used this one over here for assembling the cocktail before. So if I was starting, if we were kind of taking this to the finish line from here, what I would do with this at this point, now once I have a pretty solid bed, everything that's going to be coming through is going to be pretty clear. But from here, what I would begin to do is I would pour this gently kind of through this nest of curds again and this second pass, whereas this is kind of clear, but what we, what I would imagine if I'd been paying attention is initially you would have seen that this was cloudy and then the second batch, it began to get clear, but it was pouring into something that was already cloudy. So it kind of comes out with this haze still right here. But right now at this point in time, what's going to be coming out through this second pass right here is really going to be what is ultimately our clear cocktail right here. And so that is kind of the rough process right there at that point in time. Um, let's see. We asked about that. Good, good, good. Um, yeah, we talked about lime and lemon. Um, so yeah, I think the big thing is, is that, you know, this is overall a pretty easy process once you kind of have the basic equipment. And from there, it's kind of fun just to start experimenting at that point in time. Any thoughts? So we did it with a clear cocktail, kind of, or clear liquor, I should say. Yes. There's no reason they can't use any sort of liquor, right? Right. And you were you were talking about this before, again, using words that are above my uh, pay grade. I was, I, was, I was good in chemistry. I didn't major in it. Uh, so... You used terms for this, but yeah, my understanding is in the same way that the curds leach onto kind of the, the pulp and like the lemon or the lime, sure. there are elements in a spirit like whiskey that they are able to leach out as well. And what did you call that earlier? Right. There's, there's basically the whole family is called polyphenols, but uh, then in, in wine and other spirits, there's things called anthocyanins, which is basically color pigments. So, um, and then you also have tannins, which a lot of people know if they drink wine, because that, uh, that eventually ends in what's called astringency. So anytime you taste a, taste a wine and it's a dry wine and your mouth dries out, that's because the tannins are causing astringency on your palate. And so that is, you know, kind of another important thing to talk about. And 
question, would some of those astringency causing items still be present in a clear spirit? Like, a, so we're not going to pan it, right? But there are going to be spirits still tend to cause astringency regardless, right? right? Right. And so one of the things in general, again, when you're doing this process, so, you know, I clarified a whiskey sour before and it kind of had this really lovely, like pink hue because I put a little of this red uh, Contrato bitter, which is a lot like Campari in there. But because the, the curds begin to absorb some of those things that begin to cause that astringency, this is the other thing that makes this a relatively uh, soft, drinkable cocktail. And so this is the kind of thing, uh, I don't know if we talked about this yet. Once this is done, you can take something like this, put it in your refrigerator, leave it there, can easily sit for a month. And when you're ready to have some, pour it over ice and you're ready to go. So this is like, I like to say, since they're so in vogue right now, this is the original RTD ready to drink cocktail once you've gone to the trouble to make it right here. So this is kind of the throwback version of that right here. Um, before I forget real quick, I'm gonna come over here. I'm gonna put in the chat for the folks at home. This is always the weird look of, I can see myself on the computer right now, but I'm gonna put two articles in here for those who wanna dig a little bit deeper. Um, I feel like overall that America's Test Kitchen, uh, their article may be paywalled, I don't remember, maybe you can get into it, but they kind of dig into a lot of, they ran through this deep, deep rigor of kind of experimenting, and then they put together a great like six minute overview video on what that uh, process came out, and I think helps kind of illustrate at least their thinking in things like cold milk and pouring the cocktail into the milk, um, but it seems like whether it's one versus the other or not, you're still going to end up with something that's drinkable and fun and a, a heck of a chemistry project. So I think that's I think that's what we got for tonight. Unless no, I think we're at the same question from wait, maybe there's one more question. Hold on one second. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, so we're asking a very specific question here. Uh, the um, we're asking a, a question about a cocktail that was on the menu at a bar here in, in St. Louis called Lazy Tiger. And I don't remember the build on that cocktail enough, if it was clarified or if it was honestly just all clear items. So that would be a question you're just gonna need to run up the flagpole with them up there, even though I, I know, the, know the bar pretty well. So yeah, no, I mean, thank you everybody for tuning in. Um, like I said, this will be posted to YouTube and of course all, you can always reach out to us. Um, but yeah, thanks for, thanks for tuning in today. This has been great.